Here's another right triangle. I've labeled one of the angles as theta. I've labeled one side as v, another side as v sub x, and another side as v sub y. So this is an x subscript, and this is a y subscript. So this would be pronounced v sub x and v sub y. And of course, as usual, this is a right triangle. Now the problem is, if you're given theta and v, find v sub x and v sub y. Please pause the video and give that a shot. How is this problem similar to what we've done before, and how is it different? Um, well, obviously the way that it's different is that I didn't actually give you any numbers. All that I have done here is just put a bunch of variables in the diagram. All we have is a bunch of variables with no numbers. The way that it's similar, though, is that remember we've been doing a lot of problems where you've been given a side and an angle. We've been doing problems where you've been given a side and an angle. Well, in this problem, again, you were given a side and an angle. You were told that one of the sides has a length of v, and you were told that one of the sides has an angle of theta. Now, it might be a little weird, seem a little weird to say that we were given that information because we weren't actually given numbers for those. But the convention in physics um, is that if the problem tells us that we're given theta and v, we should kind of pretend that we have numbers for those variables. So when the problem says that you're given theta and v, that means that we should basically kind of pretend that we have been given numbers for theta and v, even though we haven't. But we're going to pretend that we have numbers for theta and v. But we're not going to pretend that we have numbers for v sub x and v sub y. That's what we're trying to figure out. The question is asking us to figure out v sub x and v sub y. It's always a good idea to use a question mark to indicate what the question is asking you for. In this case, they're asking us to find v sub x and they're asking us to find v sub y. So let's put question marks into the diagram to remind ourselves that that's what we're trying to figure out. And we're going to pretend that we've been given numbers for theta and v. That's the convention when you're given this type of problem. Even though we haven't been given numbers, we're going to pretend that we've been given numbers for theta and v, and that we're going to use those numbers to find v sub x and v sub y. Okay, so let's try to use the same techniques that we've used previously. Well, one thing we like to do is use asterisks to indicate the information that we've been given. So I'm going to put an asterisk in here and here to indicate that's information that we've been given. That's really especially useful here because otherwise it would be hard to keep track of what we've been given because we weren't actually given the numbers. We were just told to pretend that we've been given the numbers. So this is an example where it's really useful to use an asterisk to indicate what you've been given uh, because otherwise it wouldn't really be apparent from the diagram which variables we're treating as givens. And also, of course, the question marks help us to also keep track that we have not been given these values. Uh, we, haven't, we, we have not been told to treat v sub x and v sub y as givens. Another way to put it is we are being told to treat theta and v as givens. And we're being told to treat v sub x and v sub y as unknowns. We could say that we've been told to treat v sub x and v sub y as unknowns and treat theta and v as givens. And we're trying to figure out the unknowns in terms of the givens. So we've indicated the unknowns with question marks and we've indicated what we've been given with our asterisks. We've been using these asterisks in many previous problems. Something else we've usually been doing here is labeling the hypotenuse and adjacent and opposite sides. Well, clearly this side is the hypotenuse because it's opposite to the right angle. Now, which angle are we going to be focusing on? If you wanted to, you could focus on this angle up here, but that would be kind of uh, weird. Clearly, theta is the angle we care about here, so it's going to be much easier to focus on theta. That, again, is what the asterisk is reminding us. The asterisk is reminding us that we're focusing on theta. Um, okay, well then, this horizontal side is adjacent to theta, and this vertical side is opposite to the asterisk, opposite to theta. Let's make a plan for which of our trigonometric functions we're going to use. Well, remember that we've been told to pretend that we've been given v, the hypotenuse. We're going to pretend that we've been given v, the hypotenuse, so we can use the sine because that deals with the hypotenuse. And we can use the cosine because that deals with the hypotenuse. But the tangent is not going to be very useful to us because that won't let us use v for the hypotenuse. So again, since we've been told to pretend that we've been given v, which is the hypotenuse, it won't be too helpful to use the tangent because that does not refer to the hypotenuse. But the sine and the cosine do refer to the hypotenuse. Okay, we can start with either sine or cosine, but let's start with the cosine. 
Cosine, cosine of what angle? Well, we know we're focusing on this angle, theta. Cosine, cut. Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. Cosine of theta. What can we plug in for the adjacent side? Well, uh, we're labeling the adjacent side as v sub x. And what can we plug in for the hypotenuse? We're labeling the hypotenuse as v. So in this case, uh, in all the previous problems that we've done, in many cases we didn't really have something to plug in for both the top and the bottom. But in this case, we have something to plug in for both the top and the bottom of this fraction. Now, we'd like to get rid of the fraction. Well, we know cross multiplication is a good way to get rid of fractions. And now we multiply diagonally both ways. 1 times v sub x is v sub x. 1 times v sub x is v sub x. And multiplying diagonally the other way, we get v times the cosine of theta. Continuing with our cross multiplication, v times cosine of theta gives us this term. And now, actually, we're done. Uh, since we don't actually know numbers here, we don't actually have to get out our calculator. Remember that our goal was to figure out an expression for v sub x. Well, now we have figured out an expression for v sub x. v sub x is v times the cosine of theta. So we've answered that part of the problem. Of course, there's no way we could actually get a number for our answer because we weren't actually given any numbers. All we were told was to pretend that we had numbers for theta and v. Well, if we had numbers for theta and v, we could plug them in and figure out what v sub x is. So this is the conventional way to solve this type of problem. We're supposed to get an expression for v sub x using theta and v. When you see this type of language, what they mean is get an expression for v sub x that uses theta and v. Uh, and that's what we've done. Um, parenthetically, uh, we definitely would not want to have an answer here that involves v sub y, because that was not something that we were told to pretend we've been given. So we need to get an answer that's just in terms of the givens. Um, it wouldn't do us any good to figure out what v sub x is in terms of v sub y, because we weren't told to pretend we have a number for that. We're pretending we have numbers for theta and v. So that's what our answer has to be in terms of, theta and v. Uh, if, you were, if you were not able to do this problem on your own, maybe now you're starting to get the hang of it. So if this problem gave you difficulty at first, maybe you can try now to complete the problem. Maybe you should now try to pause the video and finish the problem now on your own. Well, remember that we had made a plan that we were going to use both the cosine and the sine functions. Well, we've accomplished half of that plan. We've used the cosine. Now it's time to use the sine function. So this is something that I encourage you to, 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 to do. Uh, it's helpful to write down your Sokotoa mnemonic and then use asterisks to indicate what functions you're planning to use. So we were planning to use the sine function. Uh, why were we planning to use the sine function? Uh, because the sine function um, is dealing with uh, the hypotenuse, which is one of the things that we were given. We want functions that deal with the hypotenuse because we were given that. Sine of theta equals opposite over hypotenuse. So, sine is opposite over hypotenuse. Uh, let's see, our opposite side is v sub y, and our, our hypotenuse is v. Now, to get rid of the fractions, we can cross multiply. 1 times v sub y is just v sub y, and multiplying diagonally in the other direction, we have v times sine theta. So as usual, we cross multiply to get rid of the fractions. And now we're pretty much done. Our mission was to find v sub x and v sub y. And we found v sub x and v sub y. Um, we were, we're trying to find them using the variables that were given, theta and v. Well, here we have an expression for v sub x that uses theta and v. And here we have an expression for v sub y that uses theta and v. So that's what they wanted us to do. The one thing that I can't have over here is I can't solve for v sub y in terms of v sub x, because v sub x is an unknown. Um, and I can't solve for v sub x in terms of v sub y. We have to get solutions for v sub x and v sub y that just use the, vari the variables that we're treating as givens. So we could say that this side is v sine theta. Um, now, by the way, remember that um, once you're adept at this material, you can kind of skip these two steps and go straight to here. 
Remember that this is a problem where we've been given the hypotenuse and asked for the two legs. Well, as we've discussed, that's a very standard type of problem in physics, where you're given the hypotenuse and asked for the two legs. Um, well, we know that the way to find the adjacent leg is the hypotenuse times the cosine. And the way to find the opposite leg is the uh, hypotenuse times the sine. So after a while, you're going to get so adept um, at trigonometry that you don't need to write down these two steps, and you can go straight to this step. The adjacent side is the hypotenuse times the cosine. Adjacent is hypotenuse times cosine. And the opposite side is the hypotenuse times the sine. The opposite side depends on the sine and the hypotenuse. On the other hand, if you're not comfortable with that, there's no, uh, there's, uh, no problem with writing out these, uh, those, these two preliminary steps.